suffer from. And I hope we I, I hope we wake up before before that time comes. So I'm I'm traveling also to different areas to Europe and Canada with other peace activists to amplify our voices and to say that we are the future of the region. Arabs and Israelis closer together, Muslims and Jews, and of course Christians as well. But the focus, you know, because of Israel, we have to uh, reconcile Muslims and Jews uh, far better than uh, we have to make it the focus. So I have to ask you this. I cannot let you go without asking you this. Do you see a future for the Abraham Accords? Absolutely. the Abraham, But I, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you very honestly, Astrid, we need a strong America to uh, foster the Abraham Accords even, even, even stronger. We need a strong America that believes in, in, in the Abraham Accords, and uh, and I absolutely see a future for it. Of course, this war now makes things difficult, but if if we, listen, Astrid, if we quit, Hamas wins, and we should achieve total victory against Hamas. Total victory doesn't only come militarily, but also comes culturally by standing up against their, their, their misinformation, by debunking their misinformation. I always say I'm not an apologist for Israel, but I am an apologist for the legitimacy of Israel. I defend the legitimacy of Israel because, believe it or not, Astrid, billions of Muslims, 1.5 billion of uh, Muslims uh, who live in, on this planet, millions of them are named after prophets and kings who were Israelites, who were Jewish, who lived in the, in the, in the land that they called Israel without making the, the connection. So... Uh, I, I always say that our battle with Hamas is cultural. Um, our Jewish neighbors, our Jewish friends, our Jewish cousins are uh, not wh uh, white colonialists in the land of Israel. They come from, from this region. I always say that I agree with those who say, by the way, the Jews have to go back to where they come from. I totally agree. You know, you know where Jews come from? They come from Judea. <laughs> this is why they are called Jews. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I I always say that peace is the only way forward, and we have to defend that together. Inshallah. Thank you, Louis. Very compelling words. Uh, you're, we are so grateful for you taking the time to be here with us. And we're looking forward to see what's next for you. Uh, uh, we're going to have, I see some people raising their hands. We're going to have a Q&A uh, uh, a few minutes after our main panelists speak and after we show the film. So Shireen, take it over from here. Thank you so much, Lue. Yes, thank you, thank you Lue. You really touch my heart and your, you know, the music to our ears. So thank you for standing in the gap. And thank you for being a man and standing in the gap with us because we, you know, we're a women's network, but we love having strong men uh, with us sharing this message because we, we can't do it alone. So I'm a media producer. So I just want to say after this call, I would love for us to interview you on camera and capture some of these words that you shared so that we can share it with hundreds and thousands, if not millions. Uh, that way, we're not trying to make this case alone. And we need other people at the table with us. Like I see James Patton. Thank you for joining us and Katrina Lantos and so many others. I can't call everyone out right now, but we need all of you um, at the table with us. So I just wanna take a minute now that everyone's kind of in this meeting to, um, to summarize who we are. We are Empower Women Media. We do a lot of different projects in different countries like Pakistan and Nigeria, um, Afghanistan, the MENA region, North Africa. And why do we do this? Well, we believe there is an intersection between women's rights and religious liberty. And the research shows that in countries that have the greatest religious freedom, typically there is better women's rights and also for minorities. So we're very committed to um, the Abraham Accords and initiatives that promote religious liberty and that people are living harmoniously together because yeah. religious liberty is good for peace and stability. It's good for women's empowerment and it's good for building strong business economies. And we know that when countries have economic empowerment, they're more likely to be uh, more democratic. And we're delighted to see that in places like Dubai and Riyadh, and they're moving in this direction of realizing that they need to allow for interfaith harmony, interfaith dialogue, multi-faith collaboration. And as they open their doors, um, to a diverse body of people. They have more inclusion. They support human dignity and equal citizenship. 
they realize that it's better for them as Arabs also. The other thing that you might say, well, Shireen, you know, you're Iranian. Why are you interested in Arab Arabs and Jews? Um, I have an Iranian American heritage with an Iranian Muslim father and an American Christian mother. Um, it wasn't easy growing up in a home with diverse backgrounds, but I did learn in my home that we could live together. And I saw my parents negotiate peace in our home so that we could all benefit from that. So I know it's possible. I've lived it even with a Muslim father. He lived it out for me. And so I know that if we can take this, these learnings out into the marketplace, into the universities and so forth, it's possible. Um, I also want to say the reason I'm motivated as an Iranian female is because I know that if the Arabs and Jews can have peace, it's good for everyone. It's good for women, right? Because it helps raise the station of women for everyone. Oftentimes women are the ones caught in the conflict and suffer the most, children and women. But I also know that if the Jews and Arabs can have peace, it's good for minorities also. So Christians, Baha'is and others will benefit because there'll be more peace in the region. So it's very multi-layered and I'm delighted that we can be a part of this. I'm delighted that as an Iranian, I can be a part of this because the Iranian regime, sadly, they're the troublemakers. So if we can bring more Iranians to the table too and convince them to support the Abraham Accords and to see the future that we can have together, we will all be better. So with that, we're media, we are media uh, producers. So rather than talking or you know, telling you these things, we like to show you these things. You might have learned this um, in, your, in your media background, you know, tell versus show. So we want to show you um, a short film that that Heidi has an Israeli background and Neda, who has a Palestinian background, they made. So Astra, do you want to go ahead and introduce them? And then we'll queue up the film with Aaron. Yes, absolutely. I think Heidi and Nada would be the best two wonderful ladies to introduce themselves. They collaborated uh, after they met during our first Abram Women Alliance uh, quarterly meeting uh, on November. I believe it was November 7. And they started talking to each other during our meeting. And we are just delighted that they came together, they joined forces to produce this very compelling film. And I will let the film speak for itself. Heidi and Ada, after we showed the film, please talk a little bit about yourselves. And we all want to listen to the two of you have this conversation that we're all looking forward to, to listen to. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Aaron, please, if you could uh, okay, show we'll the see the film. <laughs> the difference is Arabs and Israelis, mostly Arabs, more, more Arabs. Please put yourselves on mute, um, everyone. Thank you. I am a daughter of Palestine, one of eight daughters born to my Palestinian parents. I am a daughter of Israel. I am the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors who lived through the death camps of Buchenwald, Dachau, and Auschwitz. I am the proud wife of a former IDF captain, and I'm a Jew. I'm part of a long line of strong-willed, passionate, resilient Palestinian women. These last few months, my nights have been filled with tears, crying out for all the innocent Palestinian babies whose lives have been violently taken. Babies who look like my babies. Israel is the land for which I pray for the rain to fall in the winter and the dew to collect in the spring. Every inch of the land is steeped with my history and my heritage, and my heart always yearns for Zion. The Jews returned to the land of Israel after millennia of persecution that culminated in a genocide. But Jewish sovereignty in the land disrupted the order of things. Conflict is raging between our peoples, and it continues to do so, and it tortures my soul. I'm grateful my children are safe, but all these other innocent Palestinians 
suffering, dying. What could justify this brutality? Israel is killing these precious human beings, image bearers of God. I hate that Israeli flag. It stands for the suffering of my people, and those who wave that flag support this bloodshed. We are a dysfunctional family, and our discord is deadly. I feel the suffering of your people in my blood and in my bones. It's my suffering too. Talking with Heidi really helped me hear the cries of the victims of October 7th. It helped me question the narrative I was told, that the allegations of rape were unsubstantiated. I cried for the women who experienced such brutality, torture, sexual violence, and murder. Some of the things that I saw. The hardest part is that it feels like I'm betraying my people who need my voice to amplify their cries. It feels disloyal, although necessary, to utter the failures of my people that have contributed and continues to contribute to our suffering. For my people, it feels like once again, we're mostly on our own. And the more that we insist on our right to exist, actually the more enemies that we make. There's room for both of us to hurt. Grief, empathy, and compassion aren't limited commodities that we have to fight over. Nor does me allowing this space for you conflict or diminish or justify the suffering of my people. Actually, this could help my people. I was raised with the words of my grandfather, first in my ears and now they're lodged in my heart. But in the face of man's inhumanity to man, we must be our brothers and our sisters keepers. Love is really the only thing stronger than this darkness and evil that we've been seeing and feeling. I will love you, my perceived enemy. I will grieve your dead with you. Our people are in survival mode, but we aren't. To come out of this alive, we need the daughters of Palestine. We can't pretend that we can do this alone. Let's have the audacity and get to work building connections. Connections that will build the free, peaceful, and prosperous holy land that we want to see for both of our people. This is our resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi and Neda. We're so grateful for your film. I apologize for some of the delay in, you know, streaming films is very difficult. Um, but we want to thank the women for producing this film. And we love that it's it's just a raw film. It's not highly commercialized. It's not a Hollywood level film. It's it's from their heart. They took they're both mothers. They took a weekend to shoot this with an intern. And we thank you for your message. Can you go ahead and, and Heidi begin and just tell us a little bit about your story and why you wanted to produce this film with Neda? And then Neda, you can make some comments too. Uh, thank, uh, you. thank you. There's a little feedback on my side there. It's better now. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for being uh, here with us today and for watching this film. And why your words were what I needed to hear today. So I, I'm really grateful because I feel like if I hadn't heard what you said, I'd have different things to say right now. So I feel calmed and reassured by your firm stance against extremism and and all that stands in the op in the, the obstacles in the way to peace. Um, so Aneta, as, as Astrid and Shireen shared, Aneta and I connected back in November. Uh, no, it was December, actually. It was December. We were both in one of these Zoom calls and um, 
I'm a women's rights activist and the executive director of Women's Voices Now, and the response to October 7th amongst the international community, especially the women's rights community, was uh, particularly astonishing and shocking to me. It took my breath away, and I felt like I had spent the last decade and changed uh, actually doing nothing with my life, because if, if the violence against women on October 7th could be denied so vigorously and so immediately, I, I realized I wasn't on the same page as my colleagues around the world. And so... Um, uh, Empower Women Media and Women's Voices Now, we had a joint event in late November and Shireen shared with me that uh, this group of women was coming together monthly to share stories and to, to keep peace in mind in the future, um, but with acknowledging all that had happened, not pretending like what happened hadn't happened. And so Netta and I were in the same Zoom room and, um, you know, there's... I have been looking for Netta for decades since I went to Israel in 2007 in search of Palestine, I like to say, because I, I had learned of the conflict um, in college as an undergrad at UC Berkeley, and I just realized that I was constantly being told what to think about this very complex conflict that had to do with something, a place that is very dear and important to my life and to my heart and to my family. And um, But I, I had yet to find a partner in dialogue who'd be really willing to be honest um, as to what contributes to the perpetuation of this of this conflict. And in Neda, I found a fellow truth seeker who's willing to see things as they are for what they are so that we can move forward. And so um, we started a dialogue and it continues. And every conversation we have, um, I, I feel that both of us, I'm speaking for myself, but I have a feeling the same thing is, it's almost like we never know, will this conversation continue? Because where are we both and what have we seen and what is happening? And I'm so grateful to her that we continue to connect. We continue to hear each other's voices, to see each other's pain, to acknowledge each other's humanity. And at this moment in time, especially after happening, what's been happening on the college campuses, I just would like for us to set an example that you like dehumanizing the other just will not get us anywhere. And I feel like there's a lack of leadership, not just in the country, but adults in our households that the, where are the parents who are paying these tuitions? Where are the parents at the synagogues, the churches, the mosques? I mean, do we really want this kind of future for us all? I certainly, I certainly don't. So I just hope that we can be example of bravery and courage and the ability to speak through difficult things. As Americans, we don't like to talk politics or religion and oh my goodness, this is everything in one bowl, one bucket. And so it's it almost feels impossible, but I want a better future for my family, for my children, for Netta's family, for her children, for the future of our people. So I'm gonna push past my own ego and discomfort and talk about difficult things and, and demand that others will do the same. Please Netta, I will stop. Yeah, thanks Heidi, that was beautiful. Um, so my name's Netta and I, um, I'm not like an expert on geopolitics or Islam or really anything. Um, I was born in America, but my parents were born in the West Bank and, um, just as I'm, I'm sure with many of you, the events of October 7th really just put this front and center in my life. It wasn't in my, you know, front and center before, um, just being a mom of littles and working all the things. But, um, you know, within myself, I just felt that hatred and like the anti-Semitism that um, was ingrained, I, I feel, within within me growing up, just uh, with the conflict and my parents, you know, growing up in the West Bank. I, f I just felt that hatred that we're all seeing right now. Like I would have been that one on the college campuses, you know, yelling and angry, Um but, you know, thank God I'm not and I'm in a better place now where I can actually do things that really do help my people, you know, because I'm still I'm in this for selfish reasons. Like I want to see um, a, a Palestinian society that um, is given like dignity and freedom, right, and um, self-determination. And my vision is just to see Israelis and Palestinians live together in an integrated, dignified and equal manner. Um, so that's why I'm doing this. And, um, you know, really is unfortunate that there's so much energy and passion from our youth that's spent um, that, that's not helping. It's not helping whatsoever. And um, it's hurting. It's completely harmful. And it's being like weaponized and used as an agenda for those who want to bring America down from within. Right. And it's hurting, you know, our Jewish brothers and sisters. It's hurting the, the security of America militarily. Um, so it's really unfortunate. And um, I 
I couldn't sit back and just watch that. Uh, I know I can't change the whole world, but um, I am trying to do what I can to use my voice, to use my experience uh, as a constitutional lawyer, right? And that title that what comes with it, um, use the privilege of time that I have to, um, to use my voice for the Palestinian people. And part of that inherently is uplifting Israelis and Jewish people because they are together. They, they you know, you can't do one without the other. I can't advocate for one side without the other. Otherwise, it's just going to be like continuing what we see. And so, um, you know, another big thing is if if I want um, Israelis and Jewish people to to love Palestinians, right, and to see us and to human humanize us and give us compassion, well, I need to do that, right? Like uh, that's that's what I need to do. And so, um, it's just been a journey and it's been amazing to be able to form those relationships with Heidi and others and to to reach out and to build those bridges like even the small steps they're steps for me and so it's something that I can do that I can you know use this this emotion that I have from what's going on use it in a positive way and um just try to to break the cycle that i think um and within my family many generations of that like anger and the bitterness and the you know um it's it's dark and um i want to see a better future for my kids um i want to be able to go to palestine and to feel this the safety you know and, and to explore the beauty of of the West Bank and Israel and the beaches. Uh, that is my dream. And I do think that I'll see that in my lifetime. Thank you. Thank you so much for both of you sharing your, your honesty. And, you know, I think it's good for the, the audience also to hear about how you decided to make this film because it's very, uh, very brave. Um, one of the things I wanted you all to know as audience is we have done the research and found that media is the fastest way for women to share their message, whether it's through social media or short films. And so, you know, they have this story, but it was only shared in a small circle. And we thought, wow, how could we take your story and amplify it? And that's why we have a Empower Women Media and Religious Freedom Film Festival. We've been doing since 2017. We produce over 150 short films like Neda and Heidi's from countries like Pakistan and Nigeria and Afghanistan and Iran. They're just little short raw films, but they're very effective and very powerful. So when we heard about you, you know, growing this friendship and then writing an essay together, can you briefly tell us, Heidi, just how you developed your short film? We want to inspire the audience to think about or perhaps producing their own little short film. So go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Shireen. Well, first of all, it would not have happened without your encouragement, because while I work in film and women's rights, the intersection of those two, I am not a filmmaker. Um, I've learned things over time. And also, you know, this is like a personal story between me and Neda. Like, how, what do you mean? How can we make it into a film? But you inspired that. And I want to thank you. And then all of the things sort of fell right into place. Um, also in the chat is Erin Peterson. She um, she is a colleague of mine at Women's Voices. And now she's a young, very talented documentary filmmaker and just a all around excellent, good human being who also wants to make good in the world. And as soon as Shireen said, let's make a film, I immediately thought of Erin to be the one to, to shoot that film and to take us through the process. Nancy Schrader at Empower Women Media took, I don't know how she did it, but took our essay and created it into a script, which I'd never seen that process done. It was like literally miraculous. And of course, this was all volunteer and zero budget. Women's Voices now had the film equipment from our girls program. And so the stars aligned, which I feel is a theme of all of Nada and I's work together, that everything just sort of clicks and falls into place. And so we are both people of faith and we believe, yep, God is on our side and we must proceed even if it feels difficult and there are obstacles and it's challenging and there might be reasons not to, or we're very busy with work and children and households and everything. Um, so it's really, I would just say, um, this is work coming through us. This is not out and is necessary. This is not just us, right? This we are we are we are vessels through which something greater is happening, and that is, um, I think, why there's also a positive response to the film thus far. Even though it's what whatever quote unquote side you're on, you may see things that you know upset you or make you cringe, or um, you feel your voice isn't being heard in it. But 
I really believe that because both of us are coming from this at a place of healing and reconciliation and seeing things with open, clear, honest eyes, that um, that this is a very powerful film. And again, zero budget and everyone just stepping up to do the work that needs to be done. Beautiful. And Netta, you're a lawyer and you don't necessarily have a media background, but how was this for you to, um, to produce a short film? Like how did it impact you and what do you feel about sharing this message in the future? Um, yeah. So like Heidi said, our conversations were like private and personal. And, um, so at first it was, you know, I just felt like I wanted to protect that. I wanted to protect us. I'm not very necessarily public, um, quite private. So it was, it felt vulnerable and, um, scary. And then also on top of that, I, I haven't been outspoken about some of the issues within Palestine itself. And um, I haven't been outspoken about my support of Israel. Not that not all the actions Israel does, obviously, but, um, you know, the, the state of Israel and their their right to exist. I mean, it's still even as I say that, and I heard, I heard Lue say that, and it's like silly that we have to articulate that and that that's even an issue that a country that a, a country has a right to be a country um that's like me saying america has the right to exist you know it's it shouldn't have to be said but um so that was a part of it too just my family and knowing um just like I said in the film, feeling like I'm being disloyal to them and that they're going to see it. They're going to see what I'm doing. And, um, you know, so having to work through that and be able to um, do what I know is right, despite what other people might think and that they might disagree. People that I love dearly, you know, my sisters who I respect and like they are, that I look up to them. So that it was hard just personally on those levels. And then obviously this is, you know, I'm not, I don't do film either. Um, so it was out of my comfort zone and like, you know, shooting the scenes and like feeling awkward and uh, working through all of that. But, um, you know, it, it was worth it just knowing that, that this possibly will make a difference, like even a small little dent, you know, whether it's just within Heidi and I ourselves, um, or if it touches other people, then like all of those things that I just mentioned, which were very real struggles, worth it. You know, like, fine, I'm willing to do that. But I, it's not something that I was excited about or like, you know, sign yeah. me up or to to be a pro uh, Israel, uh, you know, speaker. <laughs> yes. Thank you. I hear you. I hear you, Neda. That's why we're so thankful for you stepping out, especially as a young mom. It's not easy to put yourself out there and you don't know what the risks are around the corner. So we want to thank you for that. And we we want to protect the people in our network. You know, we we very carefully think about the projects we share and how to share them and what are the appropriate forums. So we're going to actually move to Q&A. But before we do that, I want to plant um, a seed in you in that we are going to show another film at our next um, Abrahamic panel, which will be a live event in Southern California. And I want to personally invite all of you to come to California in July, if you can, or send someone on um, your behalf, we're gonna be showing a film called Halfway. And it was a uh, scholarship recipient film in Southern California. They had a budget, a much higher budget from the university to produce the film. It's a 12 minute film called Halfway. And in the film, they show a Palestinian Israeli family coming together and meeting halfway amidst the the battle that's going on um and so it's it's a little more stylized film but we're so proud of the film because halfway was produced by college students here in southern california the average age of the cast and crew is like 20. so imagine 20 year olds producing um a very high caliber film so we'd like to invite you to come to california july 7th uh, you can fly into orange county airport john wayne airport and the uh, event will be on july 18th from three to six o'clock. And then for those who fly in, we'll have a reception for you afterwards. So think about July 18th and we'll be sending you information about that. So, so I, would you like to move to the Q and A? Yes, yes, thank you. And I would like to add to what Shireen said. We're a very busy group. We're also in the process of putting together an event similar to the one Empower Women Media hosted in Marrakesh in Dubai, November 15 and 16, and would be honor if all of you can join us. We can 
We'll be sending emails. You can check our website and we'll forward more information to all of you. Uh, you can also follow. We have an actual website uh, in Dubai for this specific event, for the Dubai event. So put it down in your calendar. We would love to also, uh, if possible, do an excursion to Abu Dhabi to the Abram Family Center and invite all of you to join us as well. So I did receive a couple of questions and the first one is uh, Nada and Heidi. What was the reaction of your family when you both started collaborating and talking to each other? Uh, yeah, I could start. It wasn't like a, a happy reaction necessarily. Um, I didn't get, it wasn't as bad as I thought, but just um, either like a very like good job or, you know, just like a like on social media, but um, no strong reaction either way, which, which is good. I think, cause I was expecting a lot of, you know, pushback and, you know, uh, maybe even like be cut off from certain people, but that didn't happen. Thank God. Uh, for me, I mean, so my, my family is never surprised when I'm trying to do these kinds of things because it's been decades of trying to do these kinds of things. But my husband, I think what was different this time, it which was a, an incredible blessing, was that Netta came out to speak in L.A. at a synagogue on Wilshire Boulevard in mid-December. And he was able to join me and hear her speak that night. And it was not an easy crowd to speak in front of. And Netta did an incredible job of holding her ground and holding her Palestinian pride and heritage, which was so beautiful, and be able to say what has happened on October 7th is wrong and this the hatred has to stop. And so I know that he earned her deep respect that night. And um, and I feel like him being able to meet her, um, even amidst all of this hurt and pain and, and suffering that um, he and his family and all of our friends and family and everyone is going through in Israel, that he met the human behind just my talking and my saying like, no, this person is different. Like she, she has a shared vision with us. Um, so uh, positive, positive. And then, and then I, but I, I would say that I've shown the film to um, my rabbi and some other folks and it's, it's hard right now for Israelis, especially um, no, not especially for, I'm just going to say for Israelis, like the, the fact that, you know, ongoing negotiations of hostage returns, and this is very real and raw, and it's very hard to see past this present moment for a lot of people. So, um, so I would say like my greater community, I have to be not careful, just considerate of who I ask to, to view the film and to know about the work that Neda and I are doing, because I never would want to, um, bring our work together to someone who isn't in a place to see it and who would then just sort of cast it away and, and belittle it. Um, there will be a time. And that's when, that's why we have to continue doing the work and be consistent in all of us who believe in peace and, and, and a better tomorrow. Um, it's not about pressuring people, but set like walking our talk and setting an example. Although maybe right now we do need a little pressure. So I'm a little conflict. I'm not, you know, conflicted myself on how pressure and forceful we need to be about peace these days. Thank you for that answer. Um, I have a, another question that is sort of connected to the first one. Candy is asking, how is the film being used? Uh, for instance, I live in the Boston area. We see what's happening in colleges, campuses. Have you ever considered maybe visiting college campuses and talk about this? Obviously right now it's, it's pretty difficult, but what, what are your plans? What, what are you planning to do with this film? Yeah, my vision is college campuses. That is my target. That's what I would love to do and what to see because, you know, I do acknowledge there's so, there's there's a lot of good that can be, um, you know, just captured and used. Like we just need to redirect all of that energy because I do believe that these young people want to help, uh, want to help my people and they like genuinely care about social justice and, and peace and human rights. So um, I think that that's my ideal audience. You know, I want to show them. I want to show them how it should be done, like what actually is effective. Yes, and I'm just going to add. So we have a sort of a two prong strategy. One is that because Erin did this on a zero budget and she's an aspiring filmmaker, we really want her to have the opportunity to have this work seen in the film festival world. So Erin has submitted the film to somewhere between 20 and 40 film festivals last time she told me. And so we will be waiting to hear back. But um, by the end of August, the film will be available on the Empower Women Media platform, YouTube, etc. And I would also hope for Women's Voices Now 
Now platform to also be promoting the film. Um, we have a spreadsheet where we are recording, you know, university names, contacts, places that we want to um, screen the film. And while Ned and I can't be everywhere, we can do these sorts of things and we're happy delighted, honored to be part of Q&As. So if Erin put in the chat, but maybe she can drop it again, we have an email, a Gmail account for the film where screenings can be requested and we can schedule those. So if you have ideas of groups or universities, um, commun any kinds of communities that you would like the film to be screened, we are taking requests and following up on those and and just trying to to get that to happen. And of course, it's difficult to balance with all of our responsibilities, but, um, but we, we're having a working session soon to move forward on any requests that we receive and the ones that we're putting out there as well. Thank I you wanna, so much, Heidi. Yeah, Heidi, I want to piggyback on that. Um, we would love to work with you and anyone in this call. We would love to do a screening near UCLA before classes end in mid-June. So if any of you have contact with a campus group, a campus ministry, um, a venue that's either on the UCLA campus or near the UCLA campus, please contact us because we would love to do a screening of uh, Daughters of Abraham and the Halfway film. We have experience in doing film festivals, but we need to find a venue. And then we would use the films to create conversations, to get students learning the skill of how do you talk about these difficult subjects um, without shouting or yelling or hitting each other or gra graffiti or whatever. So I really feel like we need to we need to show versus tell. So if any of you have uh, contacts near UCLA, um, preferably a, just a, a safe venue, not a temple, not a mosque, not a church, just a venue. It could be a theater, a, a classroom, a community center, a restaurant uh, where we could do a screening. Please let us know. Astrid? Yes. Now, um, well, we have so many questions and I wish I had more time, but uh, I'd like to, it is quite an honor for me to invite somebody that I admire, that I admire a lot, Dr. Katrina Lantos. She's here with us. And those of you in the world, in the realm of interfaith, would, um, would very much understand who Dr. Lantos is. She's here with us and she's going to honor us with closing statements today for this meeting. I could talk to all of you for three hours, but I know we don't have the time. So I'm going to let Dr. Lantos Please take it over and uh, tell us what you think about this meeting. Tell us what, where you see us going with this with this wonderful films and the wonderful work that Shireen has done with all the films and Nancy and, and Nada and, uh, and Heidi and Luai as well. Thank you. Well, what a what a moving privilege it has really been to be with all of you today. I am full of admiration for the work that Shireen and you, Astrid, um, are doing and for the way you perceive this profound connection between media and the creative and impactful use of, me of media and a way that we really sort of change, change hearts, change minds, and through that change the world. Um, I was on the chat and, and hope I conveyed to Aloe how impressed I am, what courage he has and how eloquent he was and how moving it is to me as a daughter of two Holocaust survivors to hear his words and to be encouraged and uplifted by them. And then Heidi and Netta, uh, your film, Daughters of Abraham, is so beautiful. Now I have to confess, I already love Heidi. She's like a daughter of mine. Many years ago, Steven Spielberg um, did something really quite extraordinary. He took the profits that he had made from the Oscar winning film, Schindler's List, and used that to set up the Shoah Foundation, which was dedicated to gathering the testimonies of those survivors while they were still here with us, because of course that is a generation that is now with increasing rapidity leaving the scene. They won't be with us much longer. And so we took the, the proceeds from this very successful, very powerful commercial film to establish the Shoah Foundation. And one project of the Shoah Foundation was a very, very impactful documentary called The Last Days which took the stories of five survivors and it had sort of a, a double entendre. It was telling on the one hand, the last days of 
um, so many of those who were killed in the Shoah, in the Holocaust, but also chronologically told the stories of Hungarian Holocaust survivors, because the Hungarian Jewish community was really the last intact Jewish community to be decimated and destroyed during the Holocaust. And Heidi's grandfather, Bill Bash, and my father, the late Congressman Tom Lantos, the only Holocaust survivor ever elected to serve in the United States Congress, their stories were among the stories told in that documentary, which won the Academy Award in the year that it was made. And so Heidi and I were brought together um, through film, really, and through that powerful, impactful, um, really gift that we have of being able to tell stories. And Netta, you, you feel like a daughter and a sister today, having just met you through this beautiful film. And I want to say that the thing that I found so touching about it, so beautiful about it is that it reminds us that it is a choice to open our hearts or to close our hearts. And right now we are living in a moment where so many people around us have lined up behind their respective barricades, sometimes actual barricades on college campuses, but we can also barricade our hearts. And it's not only easy to do, but sometimes it's our automatic impulse. When we feel threatened, when we feel that those we love are challenged or the, the people we love or the land we love or the history that is so much part of who we are, when we feel it challenged, it is our natural instinct to throw up those barricades. But it is a choice, it is a choice. And we can choose to take down those barricades to open our hearts. I was so touched um, to see the, the footage of the two of you walking hand in hand, physically touching one another, because I think sometimes that's a way that opens our hearts, begins to bring down the barricade. And so I want each of you to know how beautiful the work you're doing is, how consequential it is, how important it is, and, and I think ultimately how impactful it will be. Um, I salute the courage of all of you. Um, as I say, Astrid and Sharin, Heidi, of course, my beloved Heidi, Neda Lue. And um, I just need to say to you, Neda, that you said you're not sort of a a film person, but you're so beautiful and so well spoken and so, you know, charismatic that um, that I need a little persuading that you're not a, a natural person drawn to to that spotlight. Um, and I I just feel such a, a closeness and a connection to all of you. I want to sort of just close these very brief comments by saying that while I was on listening to every minute of this wonderful hour that we've spent together, I was getting all these texts and messages on my phone. And it was people reaching out to me because today, um, President Biden was speaking at the Holocaust Museum to mark Yom HaShoah, which is the day of remembrance of the Holocaust for Jewish people everywhere in the world. And the messages I was receiving, and I'm looking forward because some sent me clips, which I haven't seen, but apparently in, in the president's closing remarks, he talked about my late father. He talked about my mother, almost 93, who has lived with me now for nearly eight years and, um, and their experience. And again, from what I understand from the messages I received, he closed with um, some of the most famous words my father ever said, which I'll share with you in a moment. But I think these words, which I think of every day, they're sort of our motto at the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice, which I founded and, and serve as president of. But they remind us that those of us, everybody here today, and those of us, um, whether Palestinian, whether Jewish, whether American, whether Iranian-American, from this incredible range of backgrounds, 
we are together and we are united in a civilizational battle for the values that are at the heart of decency, of freedom, of mutual respect, of, of opportunity, of safety, of protection for all of our children, for all of our brothers and sisters. It is not a fight for Jews. It is not a fight for Palestinians. It is a civilizational battle. And we have to win it. We have to win it on behalf of all of our futures. So with that, I will close with the words that President Biden quoted today from my father, words that I think of every day, um, and I'm so proud he said this. My dad said, the veneer of civilization is paper thin. We are its guardians and we can never rest. We are all of us guardians of that shared civilization, that proud shared civilization. The responsibility is on our shoulders to defend it. And yes, we can never rest. Thank you. Thank you, Astrid, for the chance to share these thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Lantos. So inspiring. We are so delighted that you are here and we're certainly going to look for uh, the video, hopefully, of President Biden speaking today. Uh, Shireen, would you like to uh, close the, the uh, meeting today? Yes, thank you. I always en enjoy hearing from you, um, Katrina. You you have the voice of a mother, and yet you're so brilliant in, in your, your wordsmithing. And so that combination is just honey to the ears and um, and very soothing and, and yet you know, guiding us and directing us and reminding us of the important work we're doing. And I agree with you. I think we could lose everything in one generation, you know, looking at these college students and realizing that what, what they're absorbing is going to change their worldview. And we have to be ready to counter that, but through positive messaging, through showing versus telling. And I think that's where uh, short films and storytelling, as you know, are so effective and can change someone's heart in just a matter of a few moments. So um, with that, we just wanna to continue to encourage you to stay connected. We are a, we're a network, we're not an NGO. We don't have offices and staff. We just simply are women who, we have our own day jobs, but we come together. Uh, once a month or quarterly to have these events. We're volunteer driven. Thank you to Astrid who puts so much time into this um, as a volunteer who is empowered with a, with a, uh, a role and she's a director of international partnerships. Um, and then going ahead, July 18th, we're meeting in Santa Ana, actually at the Global Relief, uh, Christian Relief has a beautiful building they've opened up to us. David Curry is the, US, the USURF commissioner and he's open, freely open that space to us. We will do a similar event with film screening panels. We'll have some appetizers. And then for those of you who fly in for the event, we'll have some kind of a reception afterwards. Um, and then looking ahead, Dubai, we want to go into the region. It's great to meet on Zoom, but we have to go into the region. We'll be in Dubai uh, November 4, 15th and 16th. The first day will be an executive briefing where we'll take executives through a, a four-part module on um, how to promote multi-faith collaboration in the workplace. And then the second day will be um, a side session where we will go to the Abrahamic Family Center and have yeah, some you. government you leaders. About. Um, so I just want to say thank you again. Someone needs to mute. Thank you again. We'd love to collaborate with you. If you have ideas, uh, people you feel that we should connect with. Um, ultimately, we are an education network. So we want to, we want to include curriculum and media and tools to get our message out. We don't just convene and have conversations, but we want to go to the next level. So I will go ahead and end there. Astrid, anything else? No, thank you everyone for spending lunch time with us and don't forget about us. We'll be in touch soon. Yes. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>